Hi, everyone. It's six o'clock uh, and welcome to the Skyscraper Museum's uh, Redux, uh, the, res the um, Return of the Modern Concrete Skyscraper, a series that we started last, um, last year and in preparation for the exhibition that we'll be doing uh, later this year, late in the year on the modern concrete skyscraper here in the gallery. I'm in the gallery of the museum uh, and I'm Carol Willis. I'm the founder, director and curator of the museum. And um, tonight we're joined for a program that is going to be a lecture delivered by Thomas Leslie uh, and with a dialogue with Bill Baker, uh, they're a pair that are returning from the first part of the series. Uh, and since there's there's such a richness of um, experience and uh, and a kind of generative discussion that has, has come out of our collaborations over um, thinking about this series, that we wanted to bring Tom back tonight with a new hat. Um, and that is to talk about, well, uh, another hat that he, um, he he's worn for quite a while, not to, to talk so much about Chicago, which is his specialty. Tom, of course, is the author of um, two definitive works on the Chicago skyscraper. The first one um, deals with the origins in 1871 through in the subtitle 1934. Um, and the second, which came out uh, a little more than a year ago, uh, called The Chicago Skyscraper, takes the, po the um, post-depression and post-war period up until the 1980s. Uh, so both Tom and Bill have talked in, this, in the series, um, to go back to the series for a moment, about the kind of landscape of Chicago, Chicago, the cityscape of the skyscraper, but also the cultural context in which um, many of the innovations um, were, uh, were uh, created. And um, a lot of that has to do with materials and technology and innovation, and a great deal of it also has to do with the role of um, SOM, Skidmore, the architectural firm Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, and the genius structural engineer Fosler Khan. So um, tonight is conceived, and let me just mention um, the other two programs that are upcoming in the series um, that uh, plays out this fall. The next one will be in October, uh, and you can see it on the, on the screen by Joseph of Colasso, who is a structural engineer who worked on this building about which he will speak, One Shell Plaza, when he was an engineer in the 1960s, and then after working uh, at SOM and with Fosler Khan. And so he'll do a, um, a deep exploration of One Shell Plaza. And then uh, in November, we have a talk on an, a, a, a Pierre Luigi Nervi building um, that you're going to see preview tonight in, in Tom's lecture uh, by Katie Phillick, uh, Phillick, who is writing her dissertation um, on this building, which is the um, Place Victoria or Place Victoria in Montreal. So it was the stock exchange and a commercial skyscraper above. Um, and uh, and, and that, again, will give us the opportunity to look at NERVI in a global context um, and then to juxtapose um, some questions that we want to ask about local versus global. And so let me go um, to uh, return to Tom's talk and uh, to um, a little more fully uh, connect him to NERVI because he is also the author of um, a book, a 2017 book called Beauty's Rigor on the um, patterns and production in the work of Pierre Luigi Nervi. So Tom is going to come on the screen in a moment uh, and share his screen and do a talk for 25 minutes or so. And then he's going to be joined in dialogue by, uh, by Bill Baker, who is a structural engineer. He happens to be uh, on the board of the Skyscraper Museum. And so we can prevail upon him these many times in order to be a commentator. Uh, but there could be, be no better person uh, in order to engage in this dialogue because Bill himself is a brilliant structural engineer and a great innovator. And um, he is 
the person who is most responsible for the conceptual design of the Burj Khalifa, the world's tallest building, and a building which is constructed of concrete, um, as almost all tall, uh, super talls are today, um, but as a, as a bearing wall structure. So these are all things that we both have explored and will continue to explore in the series. Um, but let me um, leave the screen now, having given a little bit of an overview of um, Tom Leslie's uh, credentials in order to uh, engage in this dialogue of global and local Chicago context um, genius engineers and how their influence plays out in the world. Um, so Tom, uh, you wanna come on the screen and um, I will let you take it over. Okay, thank you very much, Carol. Uh, always a pleasure to uh, speak uh, to the Skyscraper Museum and, and its audience and uh, good fun always to, to talk with Bill. I've been looking forward to this for, for, for quite a while here. Um, I will uh, start my slides here. Uh, first, with a, a, a small introduction, um, my research looks at the relationships of engineering, construction, and design, how those three spheres influence one another. And so the figure of Pierluigi Nervi, uh, who was, in a sense, all three, he was an engineer, a constructor, uh, and uh, a designer. Uh, this is a natural figure for me. I, I've been fascinated with Nervi for, for some time. And the book that came out in 2017 looks at the, the uh, relationship of uh, his engineering skills with his background in, in contracting. He came up uh, in Italy at a time when steel was very scarce and therefore uh, concrete was the, the material of choice in the country uh, before World War II. The expertise that he developed in that era really uh, came to define his career uh, in the 50s uh, and 60s. And he was best known probably for the buildings that he did for the 1960 Olympics in Rome, uh, not skyscrapers, long span sports arenas, uh, but they used his uh, methods of uh, prefabrication. You can see on the right, the Palazzetto della Sport, the little sports palace, where his characteristic intersecting ribs, this what's called a rotated lamella pattern of ribs, uh, was manufactured by making repetitive pans out of uh, lightweight cement, what he called ferro cemento. And you can see that the repetition and the kind of self-similarity of the pans uh, lent this really uh, elegant, almost spiderweb-like uh, appearance to the, to the roof. Um, on the left, this is a, a shot taken in the big sports palace, the Palazzo dello Sport, where the whole world saw Cassius Clay, later Muhammad Ali, uh, win a gold medal in the 1960 games. And this exposure uh, gave Nervi a sort of worldwide celebrity. Uh, all of a sudden, millions of people around the globe are seeing the results of his very refined engineering process, but also his very, very efficient construction process and fabrication process. And Nervi became one of the, the 20th century's great celebrity uh, engineers. And this led to work throughout the world, not necessarily uh, construction, but engineering or consultation. Uh, projects in Europe, uh, but also Africa, the Middle East, uh, America, and crucially, uh, Australia. Uh, very often, he seems to have been brought in to lend a kind of imprimatur of, of the, the artist engineer. Uh, but occasionally, also, as I'll show, uh, he, he provided real a consultation, not just in terms of calculating the structure, but in influencing the form, uh, influencing the, the architecture. His uh, background uh, in pre-war Italy uh, occasionally saw collaborations with architects, some of them not terribly successful. This is the uh, Stadio Flaminio in Florence, where Nervi's work, you see here this great uh, famous cantilevered roof over the grandstand. Nervi's work has become internationally famous in the stadium. But the sort of dressing that was plastered over it uh, by uh, the architects approved by the, the fascist state, uh, not so much, right? Not, not a great integration of architecture and engineering. On the other hand, some of his collaborations were genuinely intriguing uh, and where you can sort of see the architect and the engineer provoking one another. An unbuilt project on the left for a monument at AUR, the, the planned World's Fair that, that never happened uh, in Italy in 1942. And on the right, the UNESCO Secretariat uh, and Auditorium that he did with Marcel Breuer, 
uh, in the early 1950s, both uh, figures came away, I think, profoundly changed by the, the collaboration that they had. Breuer developing a sort of taste for brutalist concrete, Nervi uh, understanding that the engineering could, could be put toward uh, sort of integrated uh, aesthetic ends. Partly as a result of some of these early projects, uh, Nervi uh, became uh, a popular collaborator in Italy. And uh, the first skyscraper that he worked on to be built was with the Italian architect and designer Gio Ponti uh, for Pirelli, the tire manufacturer, uh, in 1953, 1956 in Milan. Uh, Pirelli was a, 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 an in, a, a company that was uh, really illustrative of what was called the Italian miracle, the re-industrialization of the country after it had been devastated by World War II. And Pirelli not only got permission, but was sort of encouraged to build not a low rise office building that uh, Gio Ponte actually thought would have been more uh, economical, but to build a real monument right in the center of Milan uh, in, front of the, in front of the main train station. Um, Ponte wrote about this project as wanting to uh, sort of combat the, the modernist idea of openness, the free plan, uh, the, the kind of open uh, glass windows. He said instead that he wanted to explore modernism of, of what he called finite or finished form, right? Closed form, something more monumental. Nervi was maybe not a natural collaborator, but turned out to be uh, an interesting one because Nervi was interested clearly in uh, expo exposing the concrete, expressing the structure that, that made the building stand up. As you can see from the drawing, Borelli is an incredibly thin slab. Uh, this is great for offices because everybody gets a window, uh, but it's very difficult for engineers because what it does is it turns the building into a giant sail that has to be stiffened against the wind. Not so much worried about it falling over as about the building moving or racking uh, in a windstorm. So in addition to a structure to hold the building up, the building needs a structure to keep it from falling over, or at least moving uh, in the direction of falling over. It needs what are often called shear walls or sort of giant cantilevers that instead of sticking out from a wall, like a cantilever beam, stick up from the ground and brace the building uh, against wind that way. Nervi accomplished this in a couple of ways. You can see at the ends of the building, these big triangular cores that carry the fire stairs. Fire stairs want to be at the extreme ends of buildings, so that works out uh, pretty well. You can see too that there's an elevator core in the center of the building uh, that stiffens the, the middle of the floor plates. There's a lot of concrete around elevators, so that's a natural place to put shear walls. And then interestingly, these two vast uh, pairs of ladder-like columns that rise through, through the building at, at roughly quarter points. Pirelli has very long spans, uh, 21 and 25 meters, uh, much, much bigger than, than typical commercial construction. And as a result, the, the structure is quite heavy. Those beams are long, uh, they, they weigh a lot, and they have to actually flare out as they hit these giant piers to handle the, the shear stress, to prevent the, the floors from literally just uh, collapsing on one another. As they go up, the piers that hold these can get smaller and smaller. The loads on them get less and less because there are fewer floors to carry. And so Nervi designed these as what he called palastro pareti or column walls. They perform sort of like columns, like four columns up at the top of the building. And they perform sort of like walls, right? Thick walls with holes in them basically as you get toward the bottom of the building. And what this does is it works very much like a, a, a tree branch or a tree uh, trunk. The building gets lighter, more flexible as it goes up, uh, and it allows the, the, the structure to be tuned. No more structure than you actually need. As the demands on the structure get less, there's less of it. And not coincidentally, on the higher floors where the views are better and the offices maybe uh, want, want to be a little grander, you get bigger, more open spaces. Uh, and, and better views uh, through, through and across the building. You can see on the right that the plans as you go up, those uh, palastro paredi or column walls almost kind of disappear, uh, making the, the, the building a kind of ideal set uh, of cantilever shapes. The connections between the floors and the walls have to be uh, stiff to, to make the, 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 uh, pareti, uh, the column walls work. 
Uh, but Nervi accomplishes this by making the, the girders deep, which they have to be uh, to accommodate the, the, the spans between them. Um, the result was really dramatic, and you can see that there are both some, uh, some uh, touches of uh, architectural finesse. The edges of those column walls are exposed, so you can see them get gradually thinner uh, as they go up the side of the building. And the concrete on the cores on the ends is exposed. And Nervi and Ponti both work very hard to get these sharp razor-like edges to those triangular cores to really give a sense of the building's elegance. Uh, Edgar Kaufman, uh, maybe Frank Lloyd Wright's biggest fan in the 50s, wrote that Pirelli was on par with the towers that, that Wright had done as setting the agenda for, for the post-war skyscraper. And Pirelli, along with other Nervi buildings, became kind of culturally uh, important as well. In um, Michelangelo Antonioni's film La Notte in 1961, it stands in as a, a symbol of kind of technological progress and the, the new Italy opposed, as you can see, to the old Italy of stone buildings uh, and, and overhead wires. Partly as a result of Pirelli's success, Nervi was part of a consortium of Italian engineers and builders and architects that was commissioned to do initially a 3 million square foot development uh, in Montreal, three towers that would form the, the commercial heart of the city and that would support the bourse or stock exchange uh, in the basement. Uh, Luigi Moretti, uh, Italian architect, was paired with Nervi as the kind of design brain trust. And together they came up with this idea of a central core, a, a, a stiff central core that had what are called outrigger trusses. You can think of these like uh, the, a skier's arms uh, that, that, that hang on to ski poles uh, and brace the building against wind uh, that way. The, uh, the trusses are located in these mechanical floors. And as you can see, they connect to uh, a, a, a stair core or an elevator and stair core in the middle. This is a, a great structural idea, uh, but the building went through uh, a handful of crises that had to do with changing uh, expectations between a Western commercial office building and an example like Pirelli, a, a corporate office tower. Moretti had based the number of elevators in the building on Pirelli, which was not speculative, was not for rent. Uh, and it became quickly apparent that expectations for elevator service were much, much greater uh, in, in Canada than, than they were uh, in Italy. As a result, this very elegant square scheme morphed. And as more elevators were added, the floor plates kind of pooched out around the structure. Uh, Nervi was upset by this because the structure now was being hidden by the exterior wall, uh, but the economics dictated a sort of beefier uh, floor plate to go around the, the, the structure itself. Another problem that the project ran into that Pirelli did not have was that Montreal's climate is very cold, and therefore in the dead of winter, the differential in temperature between inside and outside might be as much as 40 degrees uh, centigrade. Concrete, like all materials, shrinks when it cools, it expands when, it, uh, 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 when it's heated. And Nervi's calculations showed that the outside, if the concrete was exposed, would end up being about 11 centimeters shorter than the inside, which means that floors would slope, but over the cycles through the seasons, the concrete would end up being weakened. So Moretti and Nervi worked together to develop basically an insulating jacket, like a precast parka that they designed to wrap around the actual structure. So here's the concrete up here, and then you can see these insulated precast panels uh, that, that go around it. This is a technically valid uh, way to do it, but as you can see, it, it creates a problem in expression because you're no longer showing the actual structure. You're basically telling a story about the structure instead of just showing the structure. This is a problem that steel uh, construction has. We have to fireproof the steel. So you're very rarely looking at actual bits of steel structure. But for Nervi, this was a little bit of a crisis that if you can't show the actual material that's doing the work, the building isn't maybe speaking as truthfully uh, as you want it to. In uh, Nervi's archives, there are a handful of drawings that seem to show someone, possibly Moretti, especially in the case of the perspective, but I think more likely Nervi's office and Nervi himself, thinking about alternative ways to develop the structure of Plas Victoria so that the, the, the structure would be exposed, would be able to see it on the outside, it would make more sense and, and the, the columns in particular wouldn't be hidden by the curtain wall. 
None of these ended up being employed. There are a couple here that I think uh, Bill and I are, are likely to come back to in, in the discussion as precedents maybe for, uh, for future buildings. What was built was not the most elegant uh, tower. Uh, uh, Nerve was always polite about referring to it later in his career, uh, but it was not liked by the architectural press. And I think part of the reason is that you're seeing only the barest hint of what's actually holding it up, right? The, the Nervi's genius is sort of hidden by this black uh, anodized curtain wall that hides most of the most of the structure. A much more successful collaboration was Nervi's work with the Australian architect Harry Seidler. Seidler first approached Nervi in 1961, working on what was then Sydney's tallest uh, office building, Australia Square. Seidler had already come up with the idea of a round cylindrical office tower, and he had even done some sketches that show he was thinking about the structure and how it could be expressive uh, of what both holds a skyscraper up, but also what, uh, what, what steadies it, what braces it against the wind. He wrote to Nervi with his ideas, asked if Nervi could advise on some of the finer points to the structure, and also on some of the detailing that would reveal, Seidler hoped, how the structure was actually being worked and how it was put together. Interestingly, Nervi consulted on the formwork for the, the columns that hold the building up uh, around the outside. Um, these are precast panels that are assembled not to insulate the concrete. Sydney's climate is mild enough that you don't need to worry so much about thermal expansion, but actually to form the concrete. The precast panels in this case were designed to have the, the concrete poured against their backs. And therefore, even though you're not looking at the actual structure, you are looking at pieces that made the building happen, that, that actually formed or produced uh, the, the concrete that's inside. If you look at the section, you can see that the concrete columns on the edges taper ever so slightly from the base to the, uh, to the roof an indication of the fact that they're carrying less and less load as they go up, but also the fact that they are uh, kind of attenuated, that they're pulled out from the, the structure, shows that they're also doing the work of bracing the building, that they mostly work as columns, but when the wind is blowing, some of them are also working as beams to stiffen the building uh, in part uh, against the wind. The formwork has this uh, raking, sort of slowly curving set of surfaces that make that taper uh, happen in a really elegant way. And Seidler also wanted Nervi to develop the system of pans that he had used for the uh, Olympic buildings in Rome for the lobby ceiling of Australia Square. And here you can see those are the actual formwork pans. They're left in place. Nervi's drawings showing how they are formed and how the reinforcing bars in them will grip the, the, the concrete slab above. They form the series of interlocking ribs. Seidler wrote to Nervi at one point and said, your details show that you want the joint between the pans to be stuccoed so that what we read is just the rib, but I think it would be more expressive. It would tell the story of the, the way these were fabricated uh, if we left those joints unstruck, right? So they were, uh, so you actually saw them uh, in the ceiling. Nervi agreed, uh, and they were never plastered over. So you can see not only the ribs, but also the individual pans, the structure and the, the construction. Seidler went on to work with Nervi on a couple of other projects, uh, a government office building in Canberra that was done in 1973 that you see under construction on the left, that use precast, long span, post tension girders. Nervi consulted on their shape. You can see that they're uh, thick, heavy at the ends where the shear forces are greatest. And then they become sort of rounded I beams in the middle where you want to reduce the weight, but you need the maximum uh, percentage of material in the webs, the top or the flanges, sorry, the top and bottom uh, flanges to the beam. And you can see the same process at uh, the MLC Center, another concrete skyscraper uh, that again set the, the, the record for tallest building in Australia when it was done in 1974. Those characteristic shapes where the girders are solid at the ends, I-beam shape in the, in the middle. Canberra completed on the left. On the right, you can see the, the plan of MLC Center. These are the girders that form the edges of the, uh, of the structure. And Nervi uh, and Seidler worked together to come up with the formwork that would make these relatively complex shapes. 
On the left, you see the, a diagram showing the kind of Lego block way that they're put together. And all of these pieces are then uh, held tightly against one another by post-tension cables, stainless steel cables that make sure that everything is, is pushed together, uh, is pressed together. And on the right, finally, a, a, a shot looking up at MLC Center, where you can see again the, the tapering formwork that encloses the columns, uh, and then the long spanning precast girders uh, that speak very expressively about the way the forces in them uh, are, are distributed. Um, just to finish, I want to show a couple of, of projects that show that Nervi and Seidler uh, had a true collaborative relationship. The architect sort of bouncing ideas off the engineer, the engineer contributing design ideas in addition to engineering advice uh, to the architect. Seidler's design for the Australian embassy uh, in Paris was the last project that the two worked uh, together on. Nervi died uh, in 1978. But you can see that the, the piers that hold up the, the sort of secretariat or office part uh, of the building had this very characteristic curving surface that, that Nervi uh, was able to develop using linear formwork. You can just see the marks of the long, thin wooden forms that, uh, that, that are twisted to, to make this structurally efficient, but also architecturally effective shape. Um, after Nervi's death, Seidler designed what I think of anyway as his greatest uh, skyscraper, uh, the Hong Kong Club uh, in, in Hong Kong, 1980 to 1984. Um, in plan, you can see that the slab, the floor slab, looking up at the floor slab here, uh, follows the same idea as the long span girders in Pirelli, follows the same curved uh, uh, pattern as the girders in MLC or, or Canberra, uh, showing that the, the shear forces are greatest where the joists are collected at the, at the girders. So you need more concrete here to make sure that the, the loads are transferred from the joist here to the girder there. So these curves naturally flare out and allow you to put more concrete uh, where you need it to do the most work. Those floor slabs are held up at the edges by girders that have these big eyebrows. Uh, and those eyebrows give the, the elevation a really voluptuous kind of feeling, right? This is a, a super curvy building. The form is kind of like Foster's Hong Kong Bank. The structural sensibility is all uh, nervy. There's a little maybe Borromini thrown in, but this is all structurally rational. Seidler learned from nervy that the, the uh, inherent kind of language of, of structure uh, can give a, a very satisfying aesthetic sensibility uh, to a building. Those girders are precast and they're precast as T-beams. So again, there's a flange on top and you can see that what happens is the flange gets wider as you get toward the center of the span where the bending moment is greatest, where you need the most flange area to resist the bending uh, and where you want the beam to be uh, as light as possible. At the ends, you can see that the girders are sized for shear. They're deep. There's a lot of concrete uh, on the ends so that they can take uh, the, the shear load into the, into the piers. But the web, the vertical part of the T-beam actually gets thinner as you come toward the center, right? The web is doing less work. It's the flange that's resisting bending. So the flange gets larger, the web uh, gets thinner. And the resulting aesthetic is, I think, satisfying both structurally and also aesthetically. Nervi was influenced by Seidler uh, too. Uh, in the early 70s, when he was commissioned to do a sports arena for Norfolk, Virginia, he returned to the same pattern of uh, precast pans that he used in Rome to structure the dome, uh, the dome that, that set the record for largest uh, reinforced dome uh, in, the, in, in the world. But if you look closely at the scope ceiling, you can see that Nervi learned from Seidler that you want to see not only the structural performance, but you want to see how the building was put together. And so here you can see that the pans actually have the joint left open, that Nervi stopped stuccoing the joints between these pans as a way of showing how the, the, the thing was, was actually assembled, not just uh, how the structure worked. The two remained great friends uh, until Nervi's death and had a great amount of respect for one another. Uh, and I'll leave you with, with these two quotes. 
um, Seidler on Nervi, beautiful forms, uh, but also construction systems, which were inevitably translated into reality, right? These weren't uh, fantastic ideas. They were ideas that were grounded in the realities of, of fabrication and construction. And Nervi saying that he was, that Seidler was the, the, the rare architect maybe who recognized the validity of aesthetics uh, that, that are based on structures. To me, the most telling tribute is that uh, late in their work on the MLC Center, Seidler wrote to Nervi and said, we've been working on this for several years. Uh, you haven't sent a bill. Can you tell me you know, how much do we owe you for your consultation? And Nervi said, you don't owe me anything. The taxes would be more trouble than it's worth. This has been such a joy that, that, that it's been worth the conversation. Uh, a, a rare uh, tribute from an engineer to an architect uh, indeed, I think. So I will uh, leave it there. Uh, and uh, if uh, if Carol wants to come back on and uh, start the conversation we'll have, uh, I think there's lots uh, here to, to dig into with Bill. Right, um, uh, and let me invite Bill to come onto the screen as well and I'll leave shortly, but um, thanks so much, Tom. Fantastic as usual, um, beautiful presentation and so much uh, provocative thought. Um, so I will just mention again that Bill Baker is here and he's a, a consulting, uh, uh, formerly a partner and lead, led the structural engineering um, aspect of uh, SOM for many years and now um, remains a, a very active uh, consulting um, partner there. So, um, uh, Bill, one of the questions that I want to ask and um, to preview some of the discussion that will come up in the next time, in the next lecture by Joe uh, Colico is to um, is to um, speak at some point um, after you respond maybe uh, to to Tom to to collaboration and the genius of some collaborations when things that Bruce, uh, Bruce Graham and and Fosler Khan and so in that context you know we, we can you know come back and explore um, even more even without the slides uh, to show the SOM buildings but um, they will be a refrain through throughout this uh, program and indeed in the exhibition so let me turn my camera off now and let you two take over and uh, Tom that was a, that was a great presentation very very interesting and I actually learned a couple of things along the way <laughs> good <laughs> good um, so uh, what would you like to discuss first or shall I? Well, to me, the, the, I think that, that one of the real lessons uh, from Nervi's skyscraper career is this interrelationship between aesthetics and, and structure. Uh, and in Seidler's case in particular, uh, there's an architect who clearly is a fan of structural expression, uh, but understands that you know, the architect's idea of what might be structurally valid uh, is not always the engineer's idea, right? And, and willing to, to have that dialogue. So I, I'm very curious to know what, uh, you know, when, when we're looking at something like MLC Center or the Hong Kong Club, um, you know, what, what do you see at work uh, as, a, as a structural engineer that maybe an architect might not, or, or where do you see the, the engineering kind of pushing uh, against what what, it, what an architect might have come in with uh, to, to refine it uh, and maybe make it both more lucid, but also probably more uh, more efficient or more effective. Well, I would assume it's actually a dialogue where everyone ends up someplace different from where they started. But, you know that the, the interplay goes back and forth, and it's um, uh, and I, I can understand where uh, uh, Nervi was so uh, happy with Seidler because it's. Um, is that interface where, where someone actually appreciates what you bring to the table. Uh, <laughs> I, I totally understand why you didn't send a bill, okay, you know? <laughs> uh, it, 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 not just because of the tax problems. Uh, you know, the, that you know, here, here was a, an architect, a very talented architect, who could and then help interpret the technology that, that I never brought. Uh, one of the uh, books that's not behind you is the book you did uh, based on on um, on the, the lectures that Nervi gave at Harvard you know, in the early '60s, the the, the poetry lectures uh, for uh, the Charles uh, Eliot uh, Norton lecture, and in there he talked uh, Nervi, you know, in his lecture series, 
talks about the work uh, or how he got to where he was. And for uh, a good part of his formative years, he was just a contractor. Uh, and, and he thought a lot about, uh, you know, uh, how things are built and, and, and some of those details you showed on, on how the, uh, the, the cladding uh, uh, was on the, uh, um, um, on the Victoria building in the, in the corner, how, how that was done and how it, how, it, how it morphed from one to the other. Or that um, I think it was the Australian uh, pro, uh, Austrian NBC thing where, where that formwork with the massive pier, uh, it, you know, it was all about how a contractor would know how I can get what I want. That's very much more interesting for about the same price, uh, yeah. and and he and he, and he greatly uh, understood that. And and in the, those pans that he did, like if you go to the, um, you speak about the, the the little sports palace in Rome, okay. Uh, you know, uh, once you have this dome and it's all in compression, uh, it doesn't really matter how you put it. The forces are kind of the same. So, so why not do something that's interesting? And, and, and he, he had multiple solutions for that same problem. You know, he had that, that, uh, that kind of a, a logarithmic spiral that, you, that, that he used on that dome. On the, on the large one, he had a different pattern that he, that he the, the, the large Roman um, stadium that he only did. He had a different pattern. He didn't re repeat that, but but it was all driven by by the, the construction uh, knowledge that, that he had. Uh, uh, what is also interesting is what was happening at the same time elsewhere. Okay, uh, and uh, it was interesting. You know, you go back to uh, uh, the, uh, the Geoponte building, the uh, the Pirelli Tower. There wasn't a whole lot else going on back then. Okay. Uh, you know, the uh, Oliver House and Inland Steel were about contemporary with, with that, uh, you know, in the in the mid 50s, there weren't, there weren't uh, you know, and so it, here's this uh, pretty interesting uh, first step. Is it what we would do today? Mm, probably not. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, but, it, but it was, a re, uh, it shows, it, it demonstrates, in my mind, very clear thinking. Uh, in in the in basically the tall what we call the tall building problem, uh, mm -hmm. as you say, is where the giant cantilevers coming out of the ground. Well, that you you'll uh, probably understand that I uh, have stolen that from you. I remember hearing you describe uh, Burj Khalifa not so much as a building sitting on the ground, but a building that's sticking out from the side of the earth, right? <laughs> as as a way of getting across just how. Uh, yeah, just how serious the the wind problem was compared with the gravity problem, right? That gravity at that scale is uh, is much easier to deal with than than the sideways force of the of the winds. And the Pirelli section reminds me a little bit of that, right? The the you know the kind of blade of grass proportions that uh, that that Burj Khalifa has, or that um, you know you've talked about Frank Lloyd Wright's Mile High Tower. And to me, that has the same idea about you know stiff base that gradually gets lighter and lighter and more flexible uh, as as you go up. Uh, what's interesting is Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, Mile High Tower proposal was contemporary because yeah. he did it in 1956, <clears throat> and and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright had this one drawing. It was like 26 foot tall, which is some fraction of 5,280 feet. You know, a, a, you know, a mile. So it's a, fra a fraction of a mile. And he listed 11 names uh, uh, on that drawing. Uh, he li listed uh, one architect, my Liebermeister, you know, uh, Louis Sullivan. And uh, all the other names were people who had patents on reinforced concrete uh, and uh, prominent engineers, including Nervi. So, oh. so, so Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, uh, I think Nervi was one of the names. He also... He listed Roebling. Um, he listed uh, for for Mr. Professor. He listed three professors of uh, uh, structural engineering. Uh, 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 Polifka from per Berkeley. Uh, I think it was uh, uh, Hardy Cross from the University of Illinois, and then a guy named Biggs from Princeton, uh, who were all doing research in reinforced concrete. Because you know, uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright loved reinforced concrete. Uh, in fact, he gave it a, a, a you know, you always make up these names and call it continuity, you know, rather than reinforced concrete, it was like steel and concrete, um, you know, and, um, you know, and, and um, nervy, because, you know, you know, the patents that controlled um, uh, reinforced concrete for a long time uh, in, the, in the building construction were about as old as nervy, okay? I think they, it, it, they were, those patents were created within a 
few years of his birth date. And so he grew up with concrete, you know, and it was a new thing. It was a new thing that looking for interpretations. Yeah. Yeah. He would, he, Nervi was in uh, college, I believe, when uh, on a beak, the on a beak system was used on the one, the first bridge to go over the Tiber in one span, uh, which was a huge deal, right? For thousands of years, they had to build piers in the river. And Anabik has a system that comes in and with an Italian engineer is, is able to, to span it uh, at once. It's interesting, you know, uh, it, you make a good point that this is contemporary with inland steel, which is, you know, clearly a building that uh, I uh, love and think is, you know, maybe as good a, a, a post-war skyscraper as there ever was. Um, but that's, that is really a statement about a steel structure uh, and, Nervi built in concrete in part because Italy had not had a native steel industry before World War II. And after World War II, the economy was such that, that um, getting steel from abroad was simply too expensive. So concrete remained the, the material of choice until the 70s when inflation meant that you had to build faster. And, and so it was worth it to go get the steel from out of the country mm -hmm. uh, and use that. I, I wonder, from your point of view, and to the idea that this is all to support the the modern skyscraper, concrete, the modern concrete skyscraper uh, show that that Carol mentioned. How would you describe the the kind of um, conceptual or um, or uh, architectural, the general engineering difference between building a, a tall building in steel versus in concrete? Uh, is it I feel like I can look at a building from the outside and say, oh, well, that's probably steel or that's probably concrete. Most people maybe uh, can't, but it does feel to me like there's a, a, a big conceptual difference. Uh, and I wonder from your point of view, whether that's the case. And if so, what, um, what kind of very, very broad generalizations would, would you make about the difference between the two? Well, uh, it's interesting, you know, I mean, uh, they are diff different beasts. Uh, you know, the whole thing, like, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, Pirelli building that you were showing earlier with Ponte, but, you know, the whole thing where it, it was like a continuum. And that's what how, uh, Nervi did with concrete. It was like, it was, a, it was a very plastic material. You could shape it however you like. And, and, and that uh, section you showed through the building where it gets massive and then lighter and lighter as you get up is really hard to do in steel. In steel, you have very discrete elements, okay? And you either uh, brace them together or, you know, uh, you know, a, a lot of the steel buildings of the late, 19, you know, Empire State building buildings of that era had a lot, a lot of steel in it. The, 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 the weight, the amount of steel was very, very high per square foot. Uh, and they had to keep them close together. The columns were, were, were not, uh, you know, but, but the, in that era, the, they would, instead of doing like the Sears Tower or the, or the Willis Tower, where there's tightly spaced columns on the outside, uh, they would do columns everywhere uh, to, through the interior so that you end up with, with not the, the most useful space uh, in the middle, middle of the building. Uh, well, one of the things I did notice about the Nervi uh, project you showed is the fact that uh, he clearly used gravity to help resist the wind. Uh, mm. uh, that there's almost no structure that's not doing double duty. Uh, that, that's both holding up the gravity and, and, um, and uh, resisting the wind. And, and one of the secrets of tall buildings is um, is uh, is um, managing gravity. Okay, putting it where you like it. My my little water bottle here uh, ha has a ridge around the bottom. You know, it's not flat bottom. It, it has a ridge on the edge, and that's so the weight of the weight of the water in the bottle helps to stabilize the bottle uh, by 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 pushing the weight outward. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, to 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 stabilize like any coffee cup or your know, favorite cup. From, from your, your favorite coffee shop will have a paper uh, support at the edge, which makes it more, most more, much more stable. And, yeah. and that's a lot of what he's doing. Uh, he's trying to push the loads outward to the edge uh, to, to, to stabilize it. Uh, and and, yeah. and, that, and that, there's like, there's two issues in tall buildings. One is overturning moment where you want to topple. And the other is, is shear where it wants to slide. And, he, and sometimes uh, he divorces those two a little bit. Yeah. Maybe, uh to just riff on that a little bit. If I pull up a slide, it seems to me like Australia Square, maybe you could point out a little uh, what, what, um, what's going on there. 
Yeah, here, you know, this is quite interesting. You know, uh, the other problem with tall buildings is torsion. You, you, don't, you don't want them to be, and this was not well known in the 60s, uh, that torsion uh, could be a, a major problem. And there were some buildings that were built after this that had some serious torsion, torsional issues. But here, that, that center elevator thing in the middle, the kind of perforated uh, series of little T beams looking into each other, you know, that, that's like a torsional axle not unlike what we did on, on the Burj Khalifa. And then, then you have had this uh, at the perimeter, you're, you're bracing outward uh, to, and you can see everything there is doing double duty. You know, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the perimeter columns are both the uh, gravity support. There's nothing in between uh, the, the core, the, the circular core and the, and the circular perimeter, except, except the beam. So it's a completely useful space. Uh, now, what's not really emphasized in this drawing is that there are beams that, that engage the uh, perimeter columns in such a way to make it act like a, 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 a stiff, uh, so we call it a moment frame, um, uh, that, that can help resist the wind load, but also re resist the, the torsion. But it's you know, obviously very, very clean. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, another uh, 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 very interesting one is, is the... Uh, is the Montreal Tower? Uh, that's yeah. kind of that's pretty unique. Okay, and uh, and I wasn't really uh, aware of this and, uh, building until uh, you and I had talked a few years ago uh, about this. And um, and uh, and it it's a very very interesting structural idea uh, that is not very well expressed. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it reminds me a lot of of, uh, of um, the Bank of Wisconsin uh, building. Uh, it's now the U.S. Bank in Wisconsin, in, in Milwaukee. It has this exposed uh, bracing, that they essentially belt trusses, but rather than being uh, through the on diagonally like this, it, it is uh, um, it is through the um, uh, it, it, you know uh, here it's going through the middle and, and somewhat buried in what I assume are mechanical floors, uh, the, the ones mm -hmm. with. With the outriggers, uh, but you know the uh, outriggers became um, much more popular in say the late eighties, um, and this is one of the first ones I've seen. And you can see that there's very few columns. You you only have eight standalone columns, okay, and they are generally not re uh, resisting the wind loads. I have to admit, and some very bizarre uh, elevators out in the middle of the leaf span. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it was like really okay, <laughs> you know. So it was, uh, uh, you know, it, there's, uh, uh, but, you know, but it it is an interesting idea. It is a cruciform, which uh, uh, generally does have torsional problems. Uh, a, mm -hmm. a lot of architectural students like to make these model bases, which are cruciform, uh, you know, but they're really wobbly in torsion. <laughs> and they're really strong in, in the two directions. But here, uh, he, the compensation is he has. This box he goes around the the that inside X, if you will, that goes in front of the elevator. So that that little it's actually like a smaller square torsional box, but it's actually not that small. Why yeah. core, quite frankly, for a yeah, building that's it's, not that tall. It's um, compressed but chunky, uh, <laughs> I, I think. And you're right. You you would ne never see elevators out in the middle of the the lettable space. That's a, a symptom of the late. Change. They actually had to double the number of elevators late in the design process, and um, this was sort of the the kludgy way that that that, that ended up uh, coming together. That's what pushed the floor plates out beyond the the, the columns. Um, you know, and this is contemporaneous with the uh, uh, with uh, uh, the Dwight Chestnut Building mm -hmm. uh, and and the Brunswick Building. Yeah, uh, you know, which were like milestones, but but. Um, definitely a different species, a very different species than this. Yeah. So, so speaking of uh, Chestnut to Witten Brunswick, I can't resist uh, asking you about these uh, sketches. These are all, like I said, from they're kind of undated, unmarked in uh, in Nervi's archives. And to me, the way I interpret them is a, 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 an attempt to, to look for schemes that are structurally uh, expressive. Um, I, I would really enjoy hearing you kind of pick one or two of these and explain maybe what you think is going on. And also um, whether you think 
you know, whether these would be the kind of sketches that uh, Nervi's office would do, trying to maybe push the engineering out, out to the forefront, or whether you think these might be the architect sketches back to Nervi saying, would this work? Would this work? How about this? Well, you know, I don't know the architect enough, enough to, to uh, comment, but I could, could imagine uh, you've got, what, here, six images. Uh, the ones that make, are the most interesting to me are the, are the, the second and third from the left. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what I like about the, the second one from the left is that is the, the variable density of, of the horizontal structure. Uh, you, you know, and that, that and what happens in a tall building is, uh, you know, unlike a bridge where the load can either go to this embankment or that embankment, uh, in a tall building, there's only one load path down. Okay, and <laughs> and, and, and as you as you come as you come down on, on a tower, uh, you you accumulate gravity, but you also start to accumulate uh, wind load. And and when you want to win, uh, the wind load, you know, the tighter the frame, if you will. Uh, the uh, it's more it's, it's appropriate to have tighter spacing when you have more wind load, and and so your columns are 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 less uh, you know are are, are stiffer because they're shorter between the horizontals and the like. Uh, the um, the third one is of course very very interesting. You know, we've you know the diagrid is you know is always a, a favorite. Okay, it comes to go. Uh, we, we did one uh, in China not too long ago called uh, uh, Rural Bank, uh, but it's hard to do in concrete. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's 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 one in New York now uh, uh, that's o over. Uh, I'm trying to remember uh, what neighborhood it's in. It's it's uh, south of, a few blocks south of Central Park, uh, where they they have the you know kind of a diagonal bracing in concrete. But it, that's a tough that's a tough one. You know, the rebar is difficult. The formwork is diff difficult. Though I would think if anybody could do it, it would be Nervy. He'd, mm -hmm. he'd figure out a, a clean way of, of doing it. And it's in some ways not unlike uh, the uh, the dome, uh, uh, you know, uh, voids, you know, the coffers, coffered ceiling, but uh, at a at a multi-story scale, which is pretty hard to do <laughs> as a yeah. precast uh, element. Uh, yeah, but for sure. yeah, but I, I think that those those are those two are the are the most interesting to me as explorations that I could imagine someone going through. Yeah. Yeah, I, the, the second one architecturally seems counterintuitive, right? Because from a perspectival point of view, you want things to get closer and closer together as they go up, right? And kind of emphasize the, um, you know, the, 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 the height of the thing. But um, it's fascinating to hear you talk about the wind loads accumulating and the, the piers getting shorter uh, as you come down like that. The building is, again, like more flexible, uh, yeah, it, it is funny from a visual perspective point of view. Uh, it, it it does the it does the opposite as yeah. you, as you notice. If you're down at the bottom and looking up, all of a sudden it's like uh, it's almost equally spaced as you yeah. as you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like a it would be like a reverse perspective. The, uh, with, uh, if I may also uh, on this one with, with the thermal issues. Now Montreal is further north than Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, and a bit colder, but. Uh, you know, the Brunswick building was not in insulated, okay? Yeah. Uh, uh, which, uh, you know, and and uh, uh, <laughs> and let me go back a little bit further to uh, 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 your neighborhood where you live in Chicago, the Mies buildings, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, you, you know, uh, you have uh, you have 860, 880 steel buildings with a kind of a structural uh, steel-like uh, cladding elements. You got 900, 910, also by Mies, that are concrete. <laughs> <laughs> with the same with the same treatment on the outside and and you know and that's somewhat problematic okay yeah. and so uh, so if uh, if Nervi was anguishing about uh using uh you know precast uh, form work which for me is actually honest okay even though it was insulated i guess so that kind of kind of broke it off um uh, you know to do that but uh at the same time you know uh, uh you know uh Bruce Graham and Myron Goldsmith and uh, Foz Khan were doing uh, exposed concrete. That was actually, and they were they were trying to figure out how to mitigate the thermal growth of it. And and, and one of the things they did at that time, they glaze it part part of the way into the column. So part of the column is inside the heated building, uh, and part of it is outside. So the temperature is kind of an average temperature of the uh, ambient temperatures inside and outside of, yeah. of, of the building. Boy, that, that is a pre-energy crisis solution, oh, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, there's in Brunswick too, there's a, a famous Fosler Khan detail where the floor slabs are actually hinged yes. at the core and the yes. perimeter so that the, the perimeter can move up and down. Yeah. yeah. I, I've, I've, I've always wanted to run into the top floors of the Brunswick on a really cold day with a bunch of marbles and see, you know, whether they, they all fly to the, to the exterior or not. Yeah. I think um, we're getting close to time, but I did just want to say that in, in this uh, kind of rogues gallery of alternate schemes, the one on the far right looks to me a lot like the DeWitt chestnut principle yeah. uh, that you have a, basically a, a, a concrete, what could be a concrete shear wall on the outside. And you can see that the, the structure, whatever it is, it's a little hard to tell just in this pencil sketch, but the structure gets noticeably thicker as you, as you come down the building. Yeah. Um, and one of the most kind of subtle, beautiful things about DeWitt Chestnut is that even though they don't stick out from the building at all, all of the, the little mullion columns get a little bit bigger every few floors. Yeah. Uh, so there's a very natural kind of, uh, taper uh, as you go up, like the the column walls of Pirelli, but on the outside. And I I wanted to ask what whether you, you whether I was seeing that you thought maybe correctly or um, how that how that principle works. As you say, it is a, a signature sort of concrete move rather than a steel one. Yeah, yeah. What's interesting is the uh, uh, you know the, the, the rhythm, the infill of the uh, you know like uh, three windows uh, between the columns. You know. If that's purely concrete, yeah, and that would be very much a tubular system, very much similar. And it's like uh, it's almost like uh, uh, Newton and Leipzig both invented uh, calculus at the same time, uh, you know, <laughs> without talking to each other. You know, th there there was this, you know, it was there were people doing research and, and studies of this, uh, you know, and you know, uh, you know, Foscon and and Hal Anger and you know, um, you know, were were, were researchers and realized it in the Dewitt Chestnut. Uh, which, in my view, is the world's first tubular building, yeah. uh, th th and it was and it, it was the recognition of it was a three-dimensional object and not just four two-dimensional objects, are, are going, going around around the face. But 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 this you know and, and what's interesting um, I know we're running out of time is uh, that was about the same time as Les Robertson was working on the uh, World Trade Center towers in New York. Sure. And and uh, and uh, if you read Les's memoir. Uh, you know, he he talks a little bit about that and, and doesn't you know claim priority or anything like that. But it was interesting. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, um, Myron Goldsmith and Foscon and Bruce Grant were trying to take structure and make it into architecture. But my read of Les Robertson's work, he was taking architecture and trying to make it into structure, where he was ta ta taking the mullions you needed anyway and make them into the structure. So they were coming to the same place. From two philosophical uh, uh, directions, and I and I suspect that uh, the one on the far right here is probably closer to the uh, Thomas Kahn approach than uh, than the other one. Yeah, I I think so. And I if if I've got the chronology right, I think these sketches would have all come after uh, Dewitt Chestnut. So just like right paying tribute to Nervi, I think there may be uh, a kind of Nervi uh, or someone in Nervi's office maybe learning from uh, from Foz, which is a nice kind of circular. What's interesting is that Myron Goldsmith studied under Nervi in uh, Rome, uh, you know, in, in the early 50s, uh, you know, 53 or something like that. And uh, and as near as I know, that, as near as I can tell, the Chicago uh, people drilling uh, you know, skyscrapers in Chicago, you know, Paz, Myron, all those guys were not particularly influenced by Nervi and the tall building problem. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I think, you know, I think at that time there were not that many tall buildings done. So everybody was going on, um, you know, everyone must have known what everyone else was doing. Like today, there's so many buildings going up, so I can't keep up with them all. <laughs> but at that time, there were very few and everyone was important and everyone knew what everyone else was doing. So I'm sure they were aware of it, but it didn't seem to be influential at, at that time. They were, they were on their own road, they're on their different path. Yeah, for sure. So, okay. So, all right, Carol, you got to kick us off or? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're <laughs> muted, Carol. Is there? Is she back? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, 
Sorry. Uh, well, I was trying to turn my camera on and I, I think I wasn't enabled at the time, but in, in any case, here I am. Uh, and uh, to call time, but to maybe ask one last question that previews the talk next time by Joe Colasso about one um, Shell Plaza in Houston. Uh, and that is um, to ask you to, uh, because Joe worked directly with Fozcon. And so I, I wonder, Bill, your thoughts and, and also Tom about a comparison of Khan versus Nervi, if there are distinctive characteristics that, that make them um, diverge um, about uh, in engineering uh, perspectives or strategies. Mm, that's very interesting. But they certainly um, are geniuses who went in different ways. Uh, you know, I think uh, uh, Nervi, uh, you know, and it's interesting, uh, Nervi is certainly all about concrete. It, whenever he had something steel, he got some other engineer to do it. Uh, uh, you know, whereas, uh, you know, uh, Foscon, whose PhD was in post tension concrete, so his PhD was in concrete, uh, you know, goes on to do the, the 100 story steel Hancock Tower. Uh, uh, you know, so th there were cer certainly different. Um, I think more of a, of Foz as a tall building engineer and Nervi as a long span engineer, uh, you, you know, uh, and and who who each did the other thing, you know, you know, uh, Foz kind of goes on to do the Hodge Terminal, which is a long span structure, and Nervi goes on to do some skyscrapers, uh, but I think they're they're fundamentally coming from um, that was that was that was their 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 playpen. Uh, what's also interesting is all of Foz's work was done at, at SOM. In, in tight collaboration with, with, a, with a set of architects who really wanted structure to be uh, the basis of their architecture, or, you know, and, and he was able to bring ideas uh, to, you know, uh, to people like, uh, you know, uh, like Bruce Graham and, and uh, with collaboration with Myron Goldsmith. And, and so uh, uh, Khan was very lucky <laughs> in the sense that he ended up with, with people who, who were working with architects uh, who very much embraced uh, the expression of technology as the basis of, of architecture. Yeah, well, th those people were very lucky to be working with Khan, too. <laughs> um, yeah, I would I would completely agree. I think that the subtle difference between the two, like both come at the idea of the tall building as structural art, but I think Khan comes at it from first principles. Uh, and Nervi sort of grows into it almost from the details out that, um, you know, he's, he's, he's thinking about the, the kind of messiness of construction and, and that turns into systems, whereas Khan, I think, is, is sort of going the opposite uh, direction. Mm -hmm. Two valid, two very valid approaches, clearly. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't think of two people who are better equipped in order to have this discussion. Uh, and it, it does preview where we're going to go in the in the rest of the series, the two lectures that are already scheduled and uh, another deep dive into the uh, Plas Victoria uh, with Katie Fillick, where, where we'll also kind of revisit this idea of local versus global. And one thing we didn't get into tonight that I know that we have in, in previous calls and pre-calls uh, is to talk about the Chicago context and how important that is and the innovations and in materials and technology that allowed for, that enabled um, the innovations in the, in the high rise. And so I think tonight, um, Tom, where you, I think, uh, have been, you know, uniquely capable of bringing the three towers together in history, or you know, more than three towers by Nervi, but especially the ones that we've given focus. Um, this is, you know, such a rich topic, and uh, comparisons can only become more um, uh, complicated, nuanced, and enriched by this discussion. So, um, thank you both, uh, Tom and Bill, for being here again tonight. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, please come back in October, uh, on October 22nd, for Joe Colaco, and then uh, in November for Katie Fillick. And we hope we'll continue the series. So, send us your ideas. In, in fact, if there are um, people who have been doing research in areas that we're not aware of yet, we want to hear about it. So, thank Thanks everybody for joining us tonight um, and we'll see you next time.